asparagus, a valuable plant, the young shoots of which are a pleasant and wholesome food. Of more account for the table than any other greens which the spring produces. They come up early and are consequently of the greater importance. In latitude 44, the shoots are fit for use the first week in May. The fruit is a spherical red berry, which ripens in autumn, containing two black seeds. The root of this plant is esteemed in medicine as an opener and diuretic. To cultivate asparagus in the best manner, open a trench three feet wide and 12 inches deep. If it be close to the, four, the south side of a garden wall, it will be up the earlier in the spring. Fill the trench half full of good dung. Make it level and sprinkle a little rich earth over it and lay on the roots in their natural position, eight or nine inches apart. Or if you cannot get roots, place the seeds at half the distance from each other. Cover them by filling up the trench with the blackest of the earth, which was taken out. If you plant roots, the shoots may be cut the second year after. If seeds, they will not be fit to cut till the third year. All the shoots which come up before the middle of June may be cut off without injuring the roots, after which time the late shoots should be left to run up and, and seed. Otherwise the roots will be weakened. The seeds may be well preserved on the branches through the winter hung up in a dry situation. This plant grows well in ground that is shaded. The sprouts will be very large and tender, but they will not be so early. It is not amiss to have one bed in a shady place to supply the table after the season is over for cutting the first. In autumn, after the tops are turned white by the frost, they should be cleared off and a layer of dung or rich soil an inch thick laid over the bed. This should be done yearly and the bed kept clear of weeds. If the bed should get too high by this management, the surface may be taken off with a spade early in the spring to the depth of two inches before the young shoots are in the way. But when this is done, a thin dressing of rotten dung or compost should be laid on. Aspen, see poplar. Autumn, the third season of the year, see fall. Axe, a necessary tool for farmers. A narrow axe is meant for a broad axe is a carpenter's tool. A narrow axe should have a thick pole as in that part it commonly fails soonest. It should be made of the best of iron and steel. Be quite free from cracks and flaws and nicely tempered, not so soft as to bend, nor so hard as to break. Take care that you do not grind your axes thin at first till you learn by using them what their temper is and whether they will bear it. A rounding edge is best for chopping large logs. A straighter one for smaller wood. Let the helve of an axe be made of the toughest of wood, either walnut or white oak. Let it be set in the center of the eye and at right angles with the outer side of the axe. Let it be small near the eye that the hands may not be too much jarred by the strokes and chopping, and gradually larger towards the other end. Three feet is the greatest length that almost ever will be needful. 
shorter for chopping sticks, not uncommonly large. It should never be less than 32 inches. A good deal of rubbing with a whetstone after an axe is ground on a coarse grindstone is best not only to bring it to a good edge that will not crumble, but chiefly to make the blade very smooth that it may enter the wood easily and not stick too fast when entered. Okay, B, barley, hordum, a well-known grain of which malt is made. In some countries, it is also much used for bread. If it be kept long before grinding, it will be the better for this use as a certain bitter taste which it has when new is abated by age. Barley is accounted cooling and detersive. A broth of it is therefore given to persons in fevers. But it must be hulled before it is fit for this use. It is a sort of corn very suitable for cultivation in this region as it seems liable to no distemper in our northerly part of Massachusetts especially, bears the drought well, and never fails of yielding a crop. I have commonly gained 40 bushels per acre, without any extraordinary tillage, and without much manuring. It will grow in any soil, even a soil so clayey that it is fit for scarcely any other grain. Will answer well for this, as I have found by long experience, but it does better on some other soils. It should be sowed as early as the season and soil will admit. About the beginning of May is a suitable time. The quantity of seed for an acre is two bushels. If the grain be small, if larger, more in proportion. A correspondent of the Bath Agricultural Society writes, The last spring, 1783, being remarkably dry, I soaked my seed barley in the black water, taken from a reservoir which constantly receives the draining of my dung heap and stables. As the light corn floated on the top, I skimmed it off and let the rest stand 24 hours. On taking it from the water, I mixed the grain with a sufficient quantity of sifted wood ashes to make it spread regularly, and sowed three fields with it. The produce was 60 bushels per acre. I sowed some other fields with the same feed dry, but the crop, like those of my neighbors, was very poor not more than 20 bushels per acre, and much mixed with green corn and weeds when harvested. I also sowed some of my seed dry on one ridge in each of my former fields, but the produce was very poor in comparison of the other parts of the field. The ground should have two plowings at least. It should be well harrowed after sowing, and then a roller passed over it to close the soil about the corns, that they may not fail of vegetating, and rolling prepares the surface for mowing the crop, and raking it up clean, which is a matter of great importance, for it is impossible to rake it up clean when the ground has been laid rough at sowing. In Scotland, after the grain is up, the farmers near the sea coast give it a top dressing of seaweeds, which has an excellent effect. This practice I would recommend to those of my countrymen who farm near the sea. I should have observed that barley must be sowed soon after plowing, lest the moisture of the soil be too much evaporated. It being a dry husky grain, 
a considerable degree of moisture is required to make it vegetate. If the ground should be very dry at sowing time and the season late, steeping the seed in lye would not be amiss. Steeping it in the wash of a barnyard has an excellent effect. Some have got an opinion that barley should be harvested before it is quite ripe. Though the flower may be a little wider, the grain shrinks so much that the crop seems to be greatly diminished and wasted by early cutting. No grain, I think, requires more ripening than this, and it is not apt to shatter out when it is very ripe. It should be threshed soon after harvesting and much beating after it is cleared from the straw. It is needful to get off the beards. Let it lie at night a night or two in the dew after it is cut and the beards will come off the more easily. I had gained the idea of the necessity of barley's being well ripened before cutting from my own experience, I have been more confirmed in the opinion by the following passage in an English writer who appears to have been well acquainted with the culture of this corn. This grain, says he, may be greatly damaged or spoiled by being mown too soon, which may afterwards be discovered by a shriveled and lean body that never will make good malt. The same writer says, This grain I annually sow in my fields on different soils, whereby I have brought to my knowledge several differences arising therefrom. On our red clays, this grain generally comes off reddish at both ends and sometimes all over with a thick skin and tough nature, somewhat like the soil it grows in, and therefore is not so valuable as that of contrary qualities. Nor are the black, bluish, marly clays of the vale much better, but loams and gravels are better. On these two last soils, the barley acquires a whitish body, a thin skin, a short plump kernel, and a sweet flower. It has often been wished that the practice of hulling barley and other grain were introduced into this country. The time is at length arrived, and it is only to be wished that every part of the country were furnished with mills and with persons who are skillful in the business. A reverend gentleman to whom I am indebted for many useful instructions and communications writes me as follows. Barley is a hardy and profitable grain. When hulled, it is preferable to rice in every branch of cookery for which rice is used. Messrs. S. and Co. of Wells have lately erected a hulling mill. It hulls and splits peas and hulls not only barley, but all other kinds of corn and pulse with the greatest expedition. He has sent me a sample of the hulled barley, which appears to be equal to any that is imported, and further says these hulling mills, when common, must give a spring to the culture of barley. When hulled, it may be ground and bolted. The raw bad taste of barley lies wholly in the hull. I am informed that the toll they take for hulling barley at the mill above mentioned is two sixteenths or four quarts out of a bushel. This appears to be but a moderate toll. Barley that has been hulled is said to be made into an excellent flour by grinding and bolting, but little, if at all, inferior to that which is made of wheat and of equal or greater whiteness.
Barley is a corn that is very apt to degenerate unless prevented by a frequent changing of seed, but it will not become oats, as some ignorant persons have believed. I have indeed known a spot where barley was sowed to produce an entire crop of oats. The secret was that a considerable quantity of oats was mixed with the barley when it was sown, which was not attended to. When the corn was in its blade, a flock of sheep broke in and ate it down, which was fatal to all the barley. But the oats, being not so forward in their growth, escaped, and were the more productive for the destruction of the barley, which allowed the oats more room and nourishment. If ever so few oats are sown among barley, the crop in a few years will come to be mostly oats, because oats increase more than barley. Swimming the barley before it is sowed will in great measure prevent this inconvenience. Almost every oat and a few of the worst of the barley corns will be on the surface of the water and may be taken off. But the speedy degeneration of barley is a good reason for changing the seed very frequently. In some parts of the country, the barley, for want of changing, has come to produce little or nothing. Not only changing seed, but sorts of barley should be attended to. Some sorts are at least more productive than others, if not of a better quality. The two-road barley has seldom more than 32 corns on an ear. The six-road has sometimes 72. That is 12 in a row. Of the latter sort, one pint produced me three pecks in a single drill row. It was at the rate of about three pecks of feed and 40 bushels crop to the acre on a poor gravelly soil. This sort is called bear, beer, or barley big. It is a winter grain in England and Ireland. But I must mention one inconvenience attending the six road barley, which is that the seeds are apt to break off and fall if the corn stands till it is fully ripe. I now cultivate a four-road barley, which has not this inconvenience attending it, and it yields as plentifully as any other. I would recommend the drill and horse hoeing method of raising barley, when it is designed for hulling as the corns will be the more full and plump, and have a less quant quantity of hull in proportion to the flour. If the farmers in Pennsylvania have a four-road barley, which is the sort that they principally cultivate, this also has the name of bear in Europe. Bear is much cultivated in Ireland and Scotland, but in England they chiefly cultivate other sorts which they think better for malting. I have received a naked barley, so called, with no more hull on the corns than wheat. How profitable this will be, time and experience must discover. But this is undoubtedly what is called German barley, tritico speltum, or in English, spelt. Barn, a sort of house used for storing unthreshed grain, hay, and straw, and all kinds of fodder. But the other uses of barns in this country are to lodge and feed beasts in, to thresh grain, dress flax, and so on. A barn should be large enough to serve the farmer for all these purposes, for there is always more lost by stacking of hay and grain than enough to balance the expense of barn room. Regard must be had to the situation of a barn. 
It should be at a convenient distance from the dwelling house and other buildings, but as near as may be without danger of fire. If the shape of the ground permits, too low a spot will be miry in spring and fall. Too high an eminence will be bad for drawing in loads and on account of saving and making manures. If other circumstances permit, it may be best to place a barn in such a manner as to defend the dwelling house from the force of the coldest winds. The most considerable parts of a barn are the floor, the bay, the cow house, the scaffolds, the stable. See cow house and stable. The threshing floor should be laid on strong and steady sleepers, well supported beneath. Otherwise, carting in loads upon it will soon loosen it and render it unfit for the operation of threshing. It should be made of planks, well seasoned and nicely jointed, and care should be taken to keep it very tight. If it should be so open as to let grain or any seeds pass through, the grain will be worse than lost as it will serve to feed and increase vermin. A floor of board should therefore be laid under the planks. The sills of a barn should be made of the most durable kind of timber as they are more liable to rot than those of other buildings on account of the dung lying about them. White oak is very fit for this use. The sills must be laid rather low, not only for the convenient entrance of cattle and carts, but because the ground will be lowered round barns by the yearly taking away of some of the surface with the dung. They should be well underpinned with stones laid a little below the surface of the ground and well pointed with lime to prevent lots of manure. And dung should not lie fermenting against the sides of a barn, but be speedily removed when warm weather comes on. Barnyard. A small piece of enclosed ground contiguous to a barn in which cattle are usually kept. It should have a high, close, and strong fence, both to shelter the beasts from the force of driving storms and to keep the most unruly ones from breaking out. By the help of this yard, a farmer may prodigiously increase his quantity of manure if he will be careful to take the right methods. The ground of a yard for this purpose should be, of, should be of such shape as to retain all the manure or prevent it being washed away by rains. It should be lowest in the middle or at least so high on all the sides that even the greatest rain shall not carry away any of the manure. This is a matter of so much importance that it may be well worthwhile to form the ground to the right shape where nature has not done it. But a basin should not be dug so deep as to go through the hard under stratum that the manure may not escape into the earth. A yard should be larger or smaller in proportion to the flock that is kept in it. A small one is bad, as the cattle will be more apt to push and hurt one another. A large one is more favorable to the design of making abundance of manure. Not only should the yard be contiguous to the barn, but as many of the other outhouses as conveniently may be sh should be placed on the sides of the yard especially those of them which afford manure or rubbish, as the hogsty, etc. Many who have good farmyards are not so careful as they should be to make the greatest advantage by them. By confining the cattle continually in them during the foddering season, the practice of driving cattle to water at a distance is attended with great loss of manure. 
Instead of continuing in this absurd practice, the well that serves the house, or one dug for the purpose, should be so near the yard that a watering trowel may reach from it into the yard. Some have a well in the yard, but this is not so advisable, as the water may become impreg impregnated with the excrements of the cattle and rendered less palatable. He that has a large stock may save enough in manure in this way, in one year to pay him for making a well of a moderate depth. Besides securing the advantage of having his cattle under his eye and of preventing their straggling away as they sometimes do, innumerable are the accidents to which a stock are exposed. By going to watering places in winter without a driver, as they commonly do, and oftentimes by means of snow and ice, the difficulty is so great as to discourage them from going to the water. The, con the consequence is that they suffer for want of drink, and the owner is ignorant of it. All these things plead strongly in favor of the mode of watering I have here recommended. They should not be let out even when the ground is bare, for what they get will cause them to winter the worse, and they will damage the fields. There should be more yards than one to a barn, where diverse sorts of cattle are kept. The sheep should have a yard by themselves, at least, and the young stock another, that they may be wholly confined to such fodder as the farmer can afford them. But the principal yard may be for the cows, oxen, calves, and horses, and the water from the well may be led into each of these yards by wooden gutters. If the soil of the yard be clay, or a pan of very hard earth, it will be the more fit for the purpose of making manure, as the excrements of the cattle will not be so apt to soak deep into it. Otherwise, a layer of clay or marl may be laid on to retain the stale and the wash of the dung, which otherwise would be almost entirely lost. Some farmers seem well pleased to have a wash run away from their barns upon the contiguous sloping lands, but they are not aware how much they lose by it. A small quantity of land, by means of it, may be made too rich, but the quantity of manure that is expended in doing it, if otherwise employed, might be vastly more advantageous, especially if it were so confined as to be incorporated with a variety of absorbent and dissolvable substances and afterward laid on those parts of the farm where it is most wanted. It is best in this climate that a barnyard should be on the fourth side of the barn. It being less shaded, the manure will make the faster as it will be free from frost a greater part of the year and consequently have a longer time to ferment in. The feed of the cattle will also mix the material the more, which are thrown into the yard and wear them to pieces so that they will become short and fine. After the yard is cleaned in the spring, the farmer should embrace the first leisure he has to store it with a variety of materials for making manure. For this purpose, he may cart into it swamp mud, clay, brick, dust, straw, thatch, fern, weeds, leaves of trees, turfs, marsh mud, eelgrass, flats, or even sand and loam. If he cannot get all these kinds of rubbish, he may take such of them as are the most easily obtained. Any of these substances being mixed with the dung and stale of cattle will become good manure, 
but some regard may be had to the nature of the soil on which the manure is to be laid. If it be clay, the less clay and the more brick dust and sand will be proper. If a sandy soil, clay, pond mud, and flats will be better ingredients. All the materials above mentioned and many more that might be named will in one year become good manure by being mixed with the excrements of the cattle and prevent the waste of them. And this is thought by the best writers on husbandry to be the cheapest method a farmer can take to manure his lands. Considering the small cost of the materials made into manure, if water should stand long in any part of the yard, the manure must be raked out of the water and heaped round the borders of the puddle that it may be dry, for there will be no fermentation where there is too much wetness. The materials will not dissolve but turn sour. As these heaps grow dry, the water should be scooped up and thrown upon them from time to time. This will increase the fermentation in the heaps and they will grow mellow the faster. It will be of service to shovel the whole of the manure into heaps a few days before it is carted out as it will bring on a brisk fermentation and make it fitter to be laid upon the land. Or if shoveling be thought too laborious, turning it up with a plow will be advantageous. Or if there be not a deep layer, tearing it with a harrow may be sufficient. Bean, vicia, a kind of pulse much used as food both for man and beast. The sorts and varieties of beans are numerous, almost beyond account. But those which are most cultivated in this part of the world are the English bean to which the name Windsor is applied, kidney beans of various kinds, such as the case knife bean, the Canada bean, the cranberry bean, the short bean, the white bean cultivated in fields, and the scarlet bean. Sivi or saba beans are also cultivated in this climate of late to advantage. They are known in some places by the name of thousand for one beans. English beans require a moist and strong soil. Nothing that I know of will flourish better in a stiff clay. They should be planted as early as possible in the spring. In Europe, they sow them in February. There is no danger of their being hurt by a small degree of frost. If they should happen to come up early, in Europe some sow them in the broad cast way. But the drill method is better on account of hoeing between the rows as they will need hoeing. When they are about a yard high, if they incline to be too tall, the top should be broken off in the same manner as tobacco. When the first crop is all gathered, the stalks should be cut off close to the ground, excepting those on which seed is left to grow more perfectly ripe. The suckers will rise from the roots and give another green crop late in the fall. I have had a plentiful second crop fit for the table in November, but they will not be ripe nor so good for eating as the first crop. A smaller English bean called the horse bean and used to feed horses, I have attempted to cultivate. I planted them on a rich clay loam made mellow. The plants grew finely and blossomed, but bore no fruit at all, though the plants appeared in a healthy state through the summer. But I made only one experiment. Possibly others might have better success. The case knife bean is so called because the pot is shaped like that instrument and of nearly the same size. The green pods half grown are excellent food. This bean as all other of the running kind are produced in great 
plenty by the help of hog dung. With a little mixture of ashes, they ripen rather late, but a sufficient quantity of them for feed are usually ripened. They are a tender plant and should not be put into the ground till after the middle of May. The poles for them to climb upon may be set at the time when the seed is put in, or afterwards, as may be most convenient. They are amazingly productive. A bushel of pods may be had from one or two poles. But it is time that new seed be obtained from some distant country. As of late, they do not well run up the poles. Canada beans have no running vines. They ripen early and are fruitful. They are oblong shaped and of various colors, speckled, white with black eyes, cream colored, etc. The pods are not so tender as to be good for eating unless when they are very young. These and all other of the bush kind grow best in the drill way. The cranberry bean is so called from the resemblance it bears when ripe to that fruit. The vines grow luxuriantly and abound with leaves, so that strong poles are required to support them. They do not ripen quite so well as might be wished in the most northern parts of New England. But they are more fruitful than almost any other that I have met with. The green pods are sweet, tender, and a very luscious kind of food, but they are best to eat shelled. The short bean is so called from its shape. It is of a brown color. Many grow in one short pod, and each looks as if it were cut off square at one or both ends. The excellency of this kind of bean is that the pod is fit for eating when the bean has got its full growth. But the pods are liable to be hurt by a black rust if they are exposed much to the sun, though they will be fresh and fair when they grow in a shady place. Planted with Indian corn, they grow extremely well and are fit to eat green till some time after the first autumnal frost begin. The field white beans commonly grow best on a dry and warm soil, but moderately rich. The way to harvest them is to pull them up by the roots a short time before the first frost is expected and let them lie on the field. The green ones will soon ripen and escape injury from the frost. They must be gathered in and secured before they begin to shatter out of the pods. The haum, or vines, of beans should not be wasted but carefully preserved. They are a sort of fodder which sheep and goats are very fond of, though no other creature will eat them. Of beans called scarlet, the white are the best and most productive. As dried beans are of late become a considerable article of exportation, farmers should be informed that the white beans are most prized by foreign foreign markets and bear a higher price than any other. Calavents are a bean of great value and yield great crops in some of the warmer parts of New England.